Hey Tommy, do you think that Volkswagen knows this saying? What's the saying? If it's red, leave it in the shed. <laughs> it seems a little harsh. Um, probably not. The reason I bring that up is because, of course, if you're a fan of International Harvester, you may have already heard the news uh, that Volkswagen is bringing back the Scout. Well, you need to explain the saying. So this is an uh, this is a John Deere thing that well, they to used show to you say. A picture. Okay. <laughs> International Harvester was known for their red tractors. That was their color. Yep. There you go. And John Deere people used to say that if it was red, leave it in the shed. And then international people would say, you know why they paint John Deere green? Why? So they can hide from the red ones. <laughs> Wasn't there one about a bathroom too? Um, there is one about the bathroom. <laughs> Do you remember that one? I don't remember that one. I have to look that one up. Anyway, there's a lot of like these old tractor debates that go on. But yes, so why are we talking about International Harvester and Volkswagen? Because uh, the breaking news is that Volkswagen is bringing back the Scout. And in this video, we're going to tell you a little bit about the history of the Scout uh, and hopefully what that means to the modern automobile crossover slash SUV marketplace. You know what I mean? Volkswagen is bringing back the Scout. That's what I said. Volkswagen? Yes, Volkswagen. The German company yes, that, yes. that built Pe the, the Beetle. The People's Wagon. Volkswagen is bringing back the Scout. Do you understand why I'm a little bit befuddled here? Yeah, I mean, look, so International Harvester is an old American company, right? They built the Farmall, which is kind of the Model T of tractors. Yeah, International Harvester dates back, I've got the book here, all the way into, uh, you know, well past the early 20th century um, and before that even. And they are one of the go-to American companies for house name agricultural equipment, um, like you mentioned. Oh, yeah, but okay, no Formal, one cares. No you cares mentioned about, large trucks throughout the 20th right, right, century. But no one cares about any of that. Well, I know, it's I know you, you love history, but no one cares about it. Let's just <laughs> fast forward to 1960 and this, the International Harvester Scout. You want to tell the story about, what was his name, Ted? Was that his name? Yeah, exactly. How Ted came up with this? So in the, uh, by the way, if, if you're really international like I am, uh, I would strongly recommend this book. It's called International Trucks by Frederick Crisman. There's like, what, 500 pages there? Over 600 pages. And this gives you the entire encyclopedia about every international truck ever So about ever 599 made. too many, but go ahead. This is better than the Wikipedia page. You <laughs> know sure. how much information is in here? It's incredible. All right, so t this is an interesting story how, uh, because look, Here's why that's important. So does that look familiar to you guys? Does that look like anything else that you've seen that is perhaps a very modern and very popular vehicle today? And we'll get to that in a second. So tell the story. Now, throughout most of the 20th century, International was known for their tractors. They were oh, tell the Ted story. I'm getting there. They were known for their tractors and their big trucks and also pickup trucks to some extent, but they weren't known for smaller passenger equipped vehicle. In the early 1950s, a senior manager at International Harvester uh, had the idea to create something to quote, replace the horse. Kind of late. Well, I mean, Henry Ford did it, you know. And this guy's name was? Well, I don't have the name of the senior IH oh. manager, but yeah. the design lead was a guy named Ted Ornis. And Ted is a kind of a hero among the uh, international folks because he's the father of the Scout. So he started designing the Scout in the late 1950s. And in late 1958, he did the famous sketch, which was on so, the back of a napkin. So on the back of a napkin, he drew out a sketch for the Scout. And why that is important is because it wasn't too long after he drew that sketch that Harvester built the vehicle, uh, but they decided to power it with half of their V8. So they had a V8 and then they decided, you know what, it doesn't need a V8, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut it in half, make it a slant V8, slap it in the Scout, and the vehicle was extremely popular. Well, the idea was, this was a, such a breakthrough idea, right? Because if you look at post-war Europe, you had all these um, soldiers that came back and had fond memories of their Jeeps that they used in World War II. So then, of course, Willie started doing the civilian Jeep or the CJ, which was popular. But the CJ was very, very, very agricultural in its construction, in its driving experience, international. Uh, part of the, the design goal was to actually make it a little bit more usable than that. So they sure did. Uh, they took the 304 V8, 
chopped it in half. They had the 152 cubic inch four cylinder. They gave it real doors. They gave it a real roof. They gave it these sliding windows. It was only originally a front seater. And then later on, they gave it the, the step through version. Um, but it was a phenomenal idea to create and, this little runaround. And a huge success. Huge success. Yeah, they sold over 28,000 um, in, in the first few months, actually, which is insane. And just a really, really breakthrough idea. Uh, came out for the 1961 model year. The team at International put this whole project together in 24 months. Yeah, so now fast forward a through few years and there's another big company that saw the success of this and this is where it gets interesting that company is of course the blue oval company Ford and Ford decided you know we can't let these guys have all the fun and so they basically well this is a matter of debate but basically crib the design on the Scout and you can kind of see the design right there and sure. you can compare it to what the Bronco looked like back in the day. But the Bronco took the luxury a step further. So it had uh, coil springs, right? The Scout was running Leafs. Um, and then there was this big back and forth, right? You had the Scout 80, then you had the Scout 800, and then Ford launched the Bronco. And then of course, Chevy launched the Blazer in the late 1960s, which was much bigger than and, the other two. And the other thing that Ford did was they stuck a V8 289. Which International, under the hood. International eventually did eventually. Did, yeah. Actually, this fun fact, International is one of the first manufacturers to put a turbocharger on a gasoline vehicle for consumer use. So, so two important things. We bought one of these, and if you want to see one of our better videos, I'm very proud of it. It's called, um, what do we call it? Uh, getting Lucky, getting I think lucky. it was yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, because we named the, the Scout Lucky, uh, and we brought it back from a place called Lowell, Wyoming, along with the mouse, as I recall, <laughs> Yeah. in the in the, uh, in the the heater box of the Scout, and that's a really fun series because me and Tommy almost got Hunt-a-Virus trying to pull out of the barn. but. Uh, the significance of this, of course, is that it is really the grandfather to the Bronco, to the Blazer, and in some ways to the modern crossover. People think that the Bronco, you know, was the first, but it really was the Scout. And then, of course, um, after the Scout 800, you had like the Scout 2, you had the, the, the truck versions and some of the other special editions too. But the long story short is the International Scout went bust here in the US in 1980. Um, the company kind of fell in some hard times there. They killed off the nameplate and we haven't seen the Scout in over 42 years. Runs like a deer. No, so that's it. That's good. <laughs> smells like a John. John. Runs like a deer. Runs like a deer. Smells, smells like, like a John. A John. Yeah, it's a good one. I, I, it's it's good eventually to it. Well, the Scout name um, was kind of carried along in the attic of International. International was sold. Uh, I believe they're currently part of the Navistar Group. Isn't that correct? Yes. Um, and then the story goes that last year someone from Volkswagen went into the International building. Um, with the, walked out with the brand. With a giant check and then walked out with the rights to the name Scout. Not international, just the brand Scout. And now we get to the news uh, that is, of course, very timely. Uh, they are bringing back the Scout, but of course, this being 2022, they can't just bring back the Scout, they gotta make it all electric. Now, what they're saying is this is not gonna be a Volkswagen Scout. Scout is going to be its own brand. Um, potentially underneath the Volkswagen umbrella, right? It's going to be built in the US for US consumers. And um, there were some quotes that were kind of thrown around in the last couple of days, but uh, apparently, um, according to the head of Volkswagen here in North America, it's going to um, kind of be similar to Rivian, but not at a $70,000 price point, but at a $40,000 price point. And we have these two sketches. I would say the bottom one certainly looks very Rivian-ish. Uh -huh. Uh, and I would say the top one is kind of a mix between the uh, FJ that Toyota showed, the electric one, if you recall, a few yep. months ago, uh, and the Bronco. Well, so the, the the main Scout quote design language going in on here is, do you see that uh, that rear pillar? Yep. Do you see how it's slanted forward? Yes. That's what they did on the, the Scout 2. That was kind of the thing. Uh, but it's going to be an all-electric brand, kind of similar to Rivian. And they're calling it the RSUV. Really? Rugged SUV. Why not just the Scout? Or is the Scout the company? Well, Scout's the company, but but the, ah. the class of vehicle is rugged SUV. Gotcha. All right. Yep. And it's going to be built here in America? Yep, it so is. So Chattanooga, potentially? That's where Volkswagen has their current factory. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. If they it, build a separate factory? It sounded like from the stuff I've been reading that they're trying to really separate this from the Volkswagen nameplate. So I could potentially see this be built in its own specific factory. The original Scout, by the way, was built in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Yeah. So I, I think there's three takeaways from this, all right? Uh, number three, we'll count them down, Tommy, in TFL order. First of all, I think it speaks to the significance of uh, electric 
and specifically electric off-roaders, right? If Volkswagen is buying for a, an unknown amount of money uh, the Scout brand so that it can build an electric version of the original Scout, it must mean that even Volkswagen understands that they need to, um, let's call it, off roady up their brand image. Sure. Okay. I think that's number three. Number two, uh, it also speaks to the significance of electricity as a future, not just on road but off road. Yep. Because they, they, you know, they, they, Volkswagen probably has how many powertrains currently in the entire Volkswagen group? Well, would I it mean, be dozens? Everything has a two-liter turbo, so at least one. There's a lot of different <laughs> variations of diesels in Europe as well, right? <laughs> no, I'm giving them a hard time. But it seems like everything I drive now that was a two-liter turbo from the Volkswagen Group. And, and then to me, the most important thing, and we don't know the answer to this one, is, you know, will they actually create a true ground-up, fresh field off-roader, or are they going to take, like, you know, the current ID platform, which is what Volkswagen likes to do, the right? MEB. Yeah, and then stick a different top on it. So, uh, you know, if they do that, then I'm a little worried about the off-road credibility of this vehicle. If they actually create, like Rivian did, you know, a fresh design, ground-up, off-roader, then I'm going to be much more confident in its, in its you know, in its, in its kind of cred because look they've got the name so they've got a good place yeah but really uh, you know when the tire hits the dirt it's about how good off-road it is if it has all the off-road credibility that like the Rivian has or the Hummer EV has or maybe even the upcoming Cybertruck well when is this coming 2025 2026 yep 2026. and apparently we're going to see concepts for it um pretty shortly here which which will be pretty cool hey i'm just saying if if it took ted ornis and his team 24 months let's start cranking them out people <laughs> let's get them out the door <laughs> look i mean this is what's iconic right it's that kind of so jeep has an iconic face but that is also iconic it's kind of that friendly smiley happy it look it's like a happy dog right it just wants to please you uh, and the great thing about that face is that i think it cuts both ways it's very masculine and very feminine it's kind of gender neutral so it doesn't intimidate and yet it doesn't uh uh make it like too do you know goofy. do you know it was actually intended to be made out of originally um vacuum formed plastic no, I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, that was the original. There was a big push in like the late 50s and 60s for this new do you plastic. Do you regret selling your Scout, Tommy? Um, not really, because um, two things that Scouts did really well was go slowly and rust. <laughs> um, but they were very cool for what they were. I, I would get a later one. The 800s are a little better with the V8s. Uh, these are a little bit too tractor-like still, the 880s. But um, yeah, very cool vehicles. Hey, you know, what they, you know what they could do, which would be way cool? Right. Volkswagen, this is a freebie. Consider it a... a, a freebie from TFL off-road. They should include what this had, which is a PTO. Wouldn't that be badass if they actually included an electric PTO so you could like buy a modular winch that you just kind of like snap in place? I mean, I know a winch is going to have its own. So a plug. No. You want a plug. Well, a PTO would have been like an actual, you know, spinning. Yeah, but nowadays you want a plug. Okay, how about a plug? Okay, oh, and a go. winch that's actually built in so you could just snap it into place uh, on the, you know, and then maybe you could like do snap and lights as well, right? All so you want a Lego truck? Yeah, okay. why not? Well, let us know what you think in the comment section below. As always, this has been Tommy. Everybody makes fun of me. No, no, nobody it's, like... It's a fun idea. Yeah, yeah. it's a fun idea. Yeah, if well, you're nine, it's you're a gonna, good idea. No, you're going to have to differentiate well, have to, it from the Bronco and the Wrangler. Bolt stuff to it. You can't just snap it in. Why not? Because you have to, this thing's going to weigh 7,000 pounds. You're going to trust snap. Okay. Well, let us know what you think with snapping winches. As always, this has been Tommy. And Roman saying thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next video. Ciao.